Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for your presence in this place. I thank you that there are no veils and that you have blown the roof off of this place. And Lord, we ask that you would increase the power of your Holy Spirit and that you would release revelation, that you would give us understanding. Father, that you would release knowledge and insight and wisdom, especially into our secret heart. <clears throat> and so, Holy Spirit, come. Lord, we really want you to move in our midst and to turn the lights on in our hearts so that we can be free. In Jesus' name, amen. Matthew 18, starting at verse 21, the parable of the unforgiving servant. Then Peter came up and said to them, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many times as 70. And Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but 70 times seven. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wishes to settle his accounts with his servants. And when he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and with his children and all that he had, and payment be made. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring, have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of the servant released him and forgave him the debt. But when that same servant went out and he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii, he, get, he seizing him, he began to choke him and saying to him, pay what you owe. So this foolish servant fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me and I will pay. But he refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. And when this fellow servants saw what, he, what had taken place, they were greatly distressed. And they went and reported it to their master, all that had taken place. And then his master summoned him and said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And you should have had mercy on your fellow servant as I have had mercy on you. And in his anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. So also my father, my heavenly father, will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. So the title of the teaching this morning is Freedom from Bitterness. And this is one of the ways where we prepare the way of the Lord. Now, <clears throat> I want to take a look at three different kinds of bitterness that one can experience. The first kind of bitterness is that taste, that taste sensation of bitter in the mouth. It's kind of like a culinary bitterness. Now, there are four very basic kind of taste sensations that we can experience when we enjoy the food table. There's sour, there's sweet, there's salty, and then there's bitter. And the dictionary describes the bitter taste sensation as having a very harsh, a very disagreeable, very acrid taste in the mouth, like an aspirin or quinine or wormwood or something like that. And I'm curious, does anybody here actually like a bitter taste? Anybody? I didn't think so. Me either. My favorite is sweet, or at least it was. <clears throat> Not anymore, I smartened up. The second definition of bitterness means something that is very, very hard to bear. It's like grievous, it's distressful, it's painful, like a, a bitter sorrow or something extremely unpleasant. And there are a lot of examples in the Bible that show us this kind of bitterness such as when you go to the book of Ruth in Ruth chapter 1 verse 20, when Ruth and Naomi came to Bethlehem, the women of Bethlehem said, hey, isn't this Naomi? And she said to him, don't call me. She said to them, don't call me Naomi. 
don't call me Naomi. Instead, call me Mara, because the Almighty has done very, dealt very, very bitterly within my life. Because Mara actually means bitter. And so Naomi had a very hard life because she lost her husband, she lost her two boys, and this was family. And so life was really, really hard for her. And then in 1 Samuel 1, verse 10, we read how Hannah was deeply, deeply distressed. And she prayed to the Lord and she wept bitterly before the Lord because she couldn't have a baby. And everything else that we read about Hannah in 1 Samuel, she was sound like a really sweet lady. But she wept bitterly over the fact she couldn't have this baby. And then in Matthew chapter 26, verse 75, we see Peter denies Jesus. And Peter remembers the saying of Jesus, before the rooster crows, you're going to deny me three times. And sure enough, it came to pass. And then Peter's response was he went out and he wept bitterly. I mean, the un, I think of the unbelievable pain he must have felt. Because after all, Peter was the one whom the Holy Spirit had given a revelation to him about Jesus. You are the Son of God. You are the Christ, the Son of God. I mean, ouch. I mean, they were friends. And Jesus in Matthew 28 refers to his disciples as these are his brothers. So you can imagine how when this happened, and he ends up denying his friend, his brother. It pierced him right into his heart. And Peter incurred a deep, deep regret. And that's why he went out and wept bitterly. So now we see two kinds of bitterness, the culinary taste of bitterness, and just kind of hard stuff that happens in life, where life can sometimes just be a bitter pill to swallow. And that doesn't make you a bitter person, it just means some of the circumstances in your life have dealt a hard blow to you. Now, the third kind of bitterness concerns issues of the heart. And this is where one can actually become a bitter person in their soul and in their spirit. And we ask ourselves the question, how does that happen? So we want to take a look at some of the portals of entry. And Audrey's going to put up some of those portals of entry, how bitterness can actually enter into our heart. Number one, it starts out by experiencing some hurt, some pain, some rejection, some relational betrayal, or a feeling of abandonment. And, or, or somehow we didn't get the attention and the love and the cuddles and the understanding from a mate, or we didn't get it from a mother or a father, and that can open a door to bitterness. Number two, or you feel like you've been robbed of something that was rightfully yours, like an inheritance, maybe a family inheritance, and your brothers or sisters kind of screwed you out of the inheritance that was rightfully yours, or maybe a business deal that you had it all wrapped up and boom, someone else came in and sideswiped you. Or perhaps a job opportunity that was rightfully yours and then it was passed on to somebody else. Or maybe a relationship that you felt robbed of or finances that you felt robbed of. Number three, Another portal of entry can be disappointments over what should have happened or over what could have happened if only, if only. We have a lot of if onlys in our lives. Number four, injustice. Because of the wrongful choices of other people, you have to suffer the consequences of their actions it wasn't your fault. It wasn't your doing. And so you feel this deep hurt. You feel this anger. You feel this resentment. It's just not fair. And in some respects, it's downright evil, especially when you hear about all these mass shootings. Your innocent loved ones are taken out like that by someone who's just off the rails. Oh, the injustice of it all. 
We could say that about a lot of situations in life. It's just not fair. And this can be one of the biggest challenges of keeping one's heart soft and pure when it comes to the issue of injustice because it's so unfair. Number five, performance orientation. We feel pain and disappointment when God or people don't perform the way that we think they should. And so bitterness enters into our soul or enters into our spirit. Number six, tragedy or hardship. Like an illness suddenly hitting your life and everyone else seems to be having a good time but you. Oh, I felt like that when illness hit my life. I would sit there and I'd see all these people jogging by my window. And I would just think, what did I do? It just doesn't seem fair. Here I'm a young woman and I feel sick. I can't jog. I can't do this. Can't do that. It just seems unfair. You know, Asaph, I just love this guy. He struggled with it. Asaph was a worship leader. Like he was one of King David's head people who led worship in the sanctuary. And he was struggling with stuff like that. He was struggling with bitterness and he had a lot of questions. And I want to read what Asaph, this beautiful worship leader who was appointed by the king and it was his job to worship in the sanctuary. I want to read what he felt and what he said. Truly God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet almost stumbled, and my step had nearly, nearly slipped. For I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For they have no pangs unto death. Their bodies are fat and sleek, and they are not in trouble as others are. They are not stricken like the rest of mankind. Therefore, pride is their necklace, violence covers them as a garment, and their eyes swell out through fatness, and their hearts overflow with follies. They scoff, and they speak with malice. Loftily, they threatened oppression, and they set their mouths against the heavens, and their tongues strut through the earth. Therefore, his people can turn back to them and find no fault with them. And they say, eh, how can God know? Is there knowledge in the Most High? Huh? Behold, these are the wicked, always at ease. They increase the riches. All in vain have I kept my heart clean and washed my hands in innocence. Man, oh man, Asaph, he was ticked off. It's just not fair. Here I'm following Jesus and life isn't gone so cool and I look at all these other people who aren't following Jesus and man, they seem to have it really good. Something's wrong with this picture. And then Asaph goes into the sanctuary and he receives this revelation from God and we read about it in verse 27 and 28. And it says, Behold, those who are far from you shall perish. You put an end to everyone who is unfaithful to you. But for me, it's good to be near God. I have made the Lord God my refuge, that I may tell of all your works. And then, you know, he even gets further revelation because the Lord gives him revelation on some of the good benefits of actually being close to God. And he kind of figures it all out. He says, nevertheless, I get to be continually with you. And you hold my right hand. You guide me with your counsel. And afterwards, you receive me to glory. Oh, he gets a revelation of heaven. He gets a revelation beyond his earthly circumstances. And this is one of my favorite verses. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. Here he was angry, he was upset, and boom, the light bulb goes on, and the Holy Spirit took off the blinders and gave him an eternal perspective. This isn't all there is. There's eternity with God. Number seven, portals of entry. 
prayers not answered in the way that you had hoped they would be answered. And so bitterness against God sets in our soul and in our spirit. Here we prayed and we prayed and we prayed these prayers of supplication with tears, sometimes for years, asking God to heal, asking him to heal a marriage, to heal a sickness or a disease, asking him to deliver a wayward child from addictions or, or maybe there's some other situation in your life where you've prayed and you've prayed and you've seen nothing moving in the right direction. So we get this pocket of bitterness in our heart against God. Because after all, God is God. God can do anything he wants. He's powerful. He does the impossible, but he didn't. And so Asaph, once again, addresses this because in that same chapter where he's angry and he's upset, he's also bitter against God. In verses, in verses 21 and 22, it says, And when my soul was embittered and I was pricked in my heart, I was brutish and ignorant, and I was like a beast towards you. Yeah, he had, when he was pondering all this stuff before he got the revelation, he was actually bitter against God. That's really something. When we come into these situations with God, when our prayers aren't answered, the Bible says in Psalm 11, the first part of verse 5, that God tests the hearts of the righteous. And what is he testing? Do we love him just for what he can do for us? Or do we actually love him for who he is? My father, my bridegroom, my savior. Bitterness against God is rooted in unbelief, believing demonic lies about God, his nature, his character, and who he really is as found in the scriptures. Will we actually be able to say with Job, Though you slay me, yet I will hope in you. And we're confronted with these questions when we feel this anger against God welling up within us. It's a test. Where is our love rooted in our relationship with God? Now, the very root of bitterness, as we found out in Matthew 18, is unforgiveness. Unforgiveness that goes underground and it forms all of these hidden root systems that affect every aspect of one's life. And that's why the writer of Hebrews in Hebrews chapter 12 verse 15 warns us, see to it that no root of bitterness spring up and cause trouble and by it many become defiled. Because bitterness will cause trouble in our lives. And people around us will become defiled by our bitterness. Defiled means to make foul, dirty, unclean, to pollute the people around us. I, have a, I had a cherry tree in my yard, my backyard. And as this cherry tree was growing, I had all these little cherry trees growing from the root system of the main cherry tree. And my backyard looked terrible. And all, I, I mean, I thought my backyard was going to turn into a cherry orchard. There are these things poking up everywhere that came off the underground root system. And I tried everything, pulling them up, and I go, mm, and there's nothing I could do to get these stupid things up. And so an arborist came in and chopped down my cherry tree because it was diseased. And then the arborist company, they ground out the roots with their stump grinder. And as soon as the cherry, my rotten cherry tree, my diseased cherry tree was gone, and the root system was ground up, all the little stuff and the little tiny cherry trees on my lawn died because the root system was taken out. And now I have a beautiful lawn in my backyard unaffected by the root system of my cherry tree. 
In Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23, it says, keep your heart with all vigilance. I mean, really watch your heart because from it flows the springs of life. And of course, we know that Jesus is that spring of life within us. And when hurts and disappointments and injustices settle in our souls and in our spirits, left unforgiven, they become like stagnant water in the heart, in the pond of the heart, and no longer do springs of life flow, but it becomes foul, it becomes polluted, and it becomes acrid, like that bitter taste with bitterness in the mouth. And the water gets murky, it gets infected, it gets, it gets absolutely infested with all kind of bacteria that can be absolutely lethal. And bitterness can be absolutely lethal in your life. During the early summer months when I was, when I was kind of this, this teaching on bitterness was already beginning to stir in my heart, I was reading 2 Kings chapter 2, verses 19 and 22. And, and here in that uh, particular verse it says, When the men of a certain city, they came to Elijah, Elisha, and they said, you know, we have a great city. It's really a wonderful city, but we got one problem. In our city, we have bad water, and it's producing unfruitfulness. And so Elisha takes this new bowl, he fills it with salt, and he throws it in this foul, polluted water that has been causing death and miscarriage. Now, salt was very important in ancient Israeli society because it was linked to health. It was linked to hospitality, purity, durability. And they emphasized the cleansing property of salt. So salt came to stand for the most sacred of binding of obligations between two people. So you can read in the Old Testament about the covenant of salt. So Elijah, he throws this Elisha, he throws this salt into this polluted water and it becomes a purifying agent and the water is made clean. And I thought to myself, wow, what a picture of bitterness and what it does to us. It produces death in everything around us. And so bitterness stops the spring of life from flowing out of our hearts and causes us to have bad water in the heart that produces death. This stagnation or death or polluted water in the heart, it affects our relationship with God. It affects our relationship with other people. It produces an unfruitfulness in our lives, in our walk with God, where we just can't seem to press through and move forward with God's plan for our life, with God's call on our life, or with the blessings that he actually longs to give us. And that's what this polluted water in here does. Okay, so we've talked about the problem and how it can enter into our soul and our spirit, and we talked about what the roots of bitterness are, unforgiveness. Now let's look at some of the symptoms of bitterness and see if you can identify. Number one, bitterness is characterized by intense antagonism, hostility, aggressive or passive aggressive behavior. It's fierce and it's rather cruel and mean in nature. Number two, it's resentful and it's cynical. You kind of have a cynical spin on everything in life. Number three, bitterness always wants to retaliate. It wants to get even, and it finds a way to retaliate and get even in subtle little ways, snide remarks. You slip them in there, or you just put people down, or you make these snarky remarks that can surface up and come out of your mouth, because what comes out of the mouth identifies what's really in the heart. Number four, we hold grudges. And I just want to have a little side note about number four. 
It says in Mark chapter 6, verse 19, that Herodias, Herod's wife, held a grudge against John the Baptist because John the Baptist was trying to convict Herod that he was sinning by taking Herodias, his brother's wife, to be Herod's wife. And so Herodias was ticked off at John the Baptist, and she had this grudge in her. And so this grudge against John the Baptist, she wanted to put him to death. And that grudge against John the Baptist led to his beheading. Serious stuff, holding grudges. Number five, bitterness will steal away your joy. And number six, it robs us of inner peace and rest. It creates this inner turmoil and these negative conversations that are always going on in our head. It's just negative, yip, yip, yip in my head. And it causes us to make inner vows. Well, I'll never talk to that person again, or I'll never step foot in their house, or I'm never going to go to that church again. I'll never entrust myself to another woman, another man, or a friend ever again. And anything you say that starts with an I'll never, you can pretty much count on that it's an indication that you've made an inner vow. And you know what? You will be bound by that inner vow. You'll be stuck in that inner vow until it's repented of and until it's renounced in prayer. They become a stronghold in your life, these inner vows. Number nine, bitterness makes us susceptible to mental illness and mental health problems and physical illnesses. I've seen that time and time again. And number 10, imprisonment of our own soul and spirit, which we read already in Matthew 18, verses 21 to 35. And number 11, you can bet your bottom dollar it opens the door to demonic activity. You are inviting the devil in to have a heyday in your life, spiritually, mentally, emotionally, physically, relationally, you name it. And so we talked about all this stuff, the symptom, the portal of entry, and all this stuff. So what's, what are some solutions? What's the way of escape if we find ourselves caught up in this cycle and tra entrapped in this cycle of bitterness in our life? Well, Psalm 51 hold some keys for us to open the prison door and to be releasing us as a captive to this bitterness. Number one, number one, admit and face the pain. Admit and face the pain. Psalm 51, verse 6, Behold, you delight in truth in my inward being, and you teach me wisdom in my secret heart. I always tell people, until they probably get sick of hearing it from me, but I'm going to keep saying it, slow down. Just slow down and spend some time with the Lord in order to take stock of what's going on in your own soul. Know thyself. Know thyself. The lack of self-awareness will only get us into trouble because we will respond to others through these areas of woundedness that are hidden even to ourselves in our own heart. So know thyself. So often we become so busy that the day-by-day day hurts, offenses, injustices that we come up upon aren't dealt with. And they aren't dealt with through forgiven in prayer, through forgiveness in prayer. And so they accumulate over time. And then they go underground and they form this root system of bitterness. And I'll tell you, it can happen so easily you don't even know it's happening. You don't even notice it's happening. So something I found to be very helpful in my own personal daily quiet time, I say, Lord, is there someone I need to forgive? I keep short accounts, and then I wait and see if the Holy Spirit shows me if I have felt hurt, if I have felt 
attacked or there's some injustice. And then when he brings the incident to mind, I accept the invitation from the Lord in the Psalms that says, pour out your heart before the Lord. Pour out your heart before him. Don't just forgive too quickly. That sounds funny. But don't sidestep the necessity to pour out your hurt and your pain before the Lord. He's listening. Don't minimize your pain. Don't brush it aside. I've heard Christian people after someone has heard, oh, it's okay, it's okay. Well, you know, it's not okay. It's not okay. Sin is sin, and sin doesn't need to be shoved under the carpet or brushed aside. It needs to be forgiven for their sake and for your sake, for Jesus' sake, who died on the cross for that sin. Now, as we read in the psalm, once in a while you come across what's known as the bloody psalms. And I just want to give you an example of the bloody psalms, because the bloody psalms would kind of upset me from time to time. I thought, what the heck are these doing in the Bible? Anyway, <clears throat> Psalm 55, starting at verse 4. My heart was in anguish within me. The terrors of death have fallen upon me. Fear and trembling come upon me, and horror overwhelms me. And I say, oh, man, that I had wings, I would fly away like a dove. I would fly away and be at rest. Have you ever felt like that when your life is in a mess? God, I just want to be a bird and get out of here. Well, yes, I would wander far off, and I would lodge in the wilderness. That's where I'd fly off to, away from people, away from stuff. And I would hurry to find shelter from the raging wind and the tempest. Destroy, O oh God, divide their tongue. For I see violence and strife in the city. Day and night they go around on the walls and iniquity and trouble are within them. Runes in their midst and oppression and fraud and do not depart from its marketplace. For it is not an enemy who taunts me, then I could bear it. It's not an adversary who deals insolent with me, then I could hide from him. But it's you, a man, my equal, my companion, my familiar friend. Why, we used to take sweet counsel together within the house of the Lord. We walked with the throng, throng together. Man, let death steal over them. Let them go down to Sheol alive. For evil is in their dwelling place and in their hearts. Like, God, go get them. You know, it's kind of like sick and God on them. God, go get them. And then I thought to myself, I thought to myself, oh man, even when I had trouble and really felt deeply betrayed by some of my closest friends, I had trouble praying the bloody Psalms. It just didn't seem like the Christian thing to do. And so one day I asked a woman who is a very gifted theologian, and I asked her, and I said, what about those bloody Psalms anyway? Why are they even in the Bible? And her answer was brilliant, never forgot it. And she said, these psalms help us to get in touch with the depth of the pain we feel when something goes seriously wrong in our lives, like betrayal, like injustice. And I go, wow, wow. And that this is a necessary part of the road of the journey to forgiveness for the healing of our deep soul pain. Because forgiveness needs to flow to the deepest places where the pain exists. And if you never get in touch with the pain, if you just do surfacey stuff, you get surfacey forgiveness, and there are still little pockets in there. But if you allow the Holy Spirit to take you into the depth of the pain in your heart, and it's okay to blow a gasket before the Lord, He's smart. He can handle it. He's not going to strike you with lightning bolts, but he's going to receive your hurt. He's going to receive your pain, and then he'll be able to show you the way of escape. And so after the psalmist admits the pain, his heart softens, and he turns his heart to God. In verses 16 and 19, it says, But I call to God. And the Lord who will save me, because I think he was getting in touch with just how ticked he was, how hurt he was, how betrayed he felt. 
He really got in touch with his pain. Evening and morning and at noon, I uttered my complaint, and he moaned. That's getting in touch with your pain. And this is cool, and he hears my voice. He redeems my soul in safety from the battle that I wage, for many are arrayed against me. Is that beautiful? That we, can, we have a heavenly father that we can be totally honest with, totally open with, and say, man, I'm hurt, I'm angry, this happened to me. And we can pour out our heart before God, and then he helps us, he brings us through. Number two, always remember the grace. This is helping, solutions. Always remember the grace and forgiveness that God has extended to you. And I just want to read to you a reminder. Romans 3, verses 9 to 18. It says, what then? Are we Jews any better off? No, not at all. For we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin. As it's written, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God. All have turned aside together. They have all become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave, and their tongue leads to deceit. The venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood, and in their paths are ruin and misery and the way of peace they have not known. And they have no fear of God before their eyes. Now, this is the description of our fallen nature. Every one of us, this is our fallen nature and our need for God. And I love what it says in Luke. This is a cool story that really exposes stuff. Lots of scriptures today because we want to hear what it says in the word of God. Okay, it's Luke 18. Verses 19, verses 19 to 14, verses 9 to 14, I'm sorry. The parable and the, the Pharisee and the tax collector. He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. So two men went into the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. And the Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men. I'm not an extortioner. I'm not unjust. I'm not an adulterer, even like this tax collector. Why, I fast twice a week. I give tithes to all that I get. But this tax collector, standing afar off, would not even lift his eyes to heaven. But he beat his chest saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Now, this tax collector, he really looked good. I mean, he really genuinely didn't do anything wrong. You look at his life and he said, ah, clean living, you know. But it was self-righteousness. Self-righteousness justifies bitterness. Self-righteousness justifies bitterness. Lodged deep in the bitter soul and spirit, there's a little Pharisee walking around. And you can envision him like a Pac-Man, kind of eating away at your heart. And chomping away at the life of God within you. Yeah, I like that. I saw that picture. He's walking around in there. And sometimes we need a revelation of the desperate wickedness of our own heart in order to freely forgive others as we have been freely forgiven. The Lord gave me that revelation years ago as I started counseling with people, and I am forever grateful to him. Because no matter what you hear or see other people doing, you know you're capable of it too. So you can't stand with a critical eye or a judgmental eye on any person, no matter what you see or hear. Number three, ask Jesus to help you to forgive. Hebrews 4, verse 15 on, for we do not have a high priest 
who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are tempted yet without sin. And when you look at the life of Jesus, he had every reason to be angry, hurt, and bitter with everything that he suffered. So let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace and to receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And when I was having a difficult time forgiving others, I took Jesus up on his invitation. And I, it really works. I needed his help. Never forget that you have available to you the power of the Holy Spirit to work, help you work through these issues of anger, hurt, and bitterness. Number four, repent of an unforgiving heart. When unforgiveness and bitterness starts to take over in your heart, you can literally feel hardness setting in. And joy, you can feel it literally slipping away. Been there, done that. Cynicism and just this nasty behavior starts to slip in. And you're not able to really get in touch with the presence of God. And you feel like your ship is sinking. It's kind of scary. It really is scary. And that's a good time to go back to Psalm 51. Oh, create in me a clean heart, O oh God. And renew within me a right spirit. Purge me with hyssop so that I shall be clean and wash me so that I will be whiter than snow. Because sometimes we need help. So numbers three and four are very closely related as we pray these kinds of prayers, asking God for help. Jesus is present. He's listening. He's not going to bring judgment over you. But he wants to open the prison door and he wants to set that one imprisoned by bitterness completely free. And instead of throwing salt in your stagnant pond of the heart, he purifies the heart with the blood of Jesus and the cross where he takes all that stuff onto himself. And then there's number five. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. That's in Matthew chapter 5. So that we can look like Jesus. So that we can be like Jesus. In 1 John 4, verses 16 to, 16 to 17, it says, We know and we rely on the love of God that he has for us. Because God is love. And whoever lives in love lives in God, and God in him. In this way, love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment because in this world, we are like him. Look what he forgave us for. And we want to be like him. Wounded people wound people. So we can love our enemies by asking the Lord to reveal his love to them, to heal the wounds within their hearts that cause them to wound other people. Because when we love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us, we are actually moving in the opposite spirit. We move away from the hatred and the bitterness and the retaliation and the negativity, and we move towards forgiveness. We move towards freedom. And then you know what happens? Had this experience too. You literally feel a weight lifting off your back, like you've been carrying a 100-pound backpack. You can breathe again. So free. Joy returns. The joy of the Lord can be your strength again. And you know, sick bodies can be instantly healed. I've seen it happen. I saw a woman instantly healed of diabetes when she walked down the block, knocked on the door, and forgave the woman who stole her husband. I saw a woman who had severe, severe back pain instantly healed when she forgave her invalid mother for kind of taking over her teen years and she had to stay home and help her and there was bitterness in her heart over that. And when she forgave her mother, she was instantly healed. 
I saw a woman instantly healed of GI problems and stomach problems, constant stomach problems. And when she forgave her mother and her father for all the rejection she experienced, she was instantly healed, instantly. And the physical problem went away. And peace and rest return to the soul. Now we don't have to stay stuck or imprisoned by bitterness, but receiving forgiveness through the cross and through the blood of Jesus, then we can give it away to others what has actually been given to us. And you know what it is? It's our get out of jail free card. You don't have to stay in jail in Matthew 18. But the cross and the blood are your get out of jail free card.